This is the Day of Battle podcast. I'm Joe Hayes. Welcome back. I want to share my story with you today. I want to tell you about the life-changing event that happened to me when I was serving in Iraq. Before I get there, I need to mention that I wanted to be a soldier my entire life. I grew up, and from the time I could walk around, I was wearing camouflage. I grew up hunting quail on the side of a mountain and shooting rattlesnakes with my pellet gun. I was just always outdoors, always playing army, and I wanted nothing more than to serve my country and do what my father had done, what my grandfather's, what my great-great-grandfather had done. And service was just bred into me. I grew up grateful to be an American. And I grew up loving this country. And I still do to this day. So, after graduating high school, I chose the Marine Corps. I went in there. This was all before 9-11 had happened. It was actually in the spring of 2001. And I went through boot camp and went to infantry school. My goal was to become a rifleman. And that's actually what I was selected to be while I was in the school of infantry. 9-11 occurred. And that day changed everything for us. All of a sudden, everything we were doing became so much more serious. And we knew that we were going to have to put our training into action in the future. So after finishing the School of Infantry, I was stationed at Camp Pendleton, California in San Mateo with the 5th Marines, and I was assigned to the 2nd Battalion, 4th Marine Regiment. I went to Golf Company, 3rd Platoon. When I first got there to the unit, our unit was assigned as a quick reaction force for everything on the west coast of the United States. In the event of any additional terrorist attacks following 9-11, we were going to be deployed anywhere on the West Coast. And we were training hard for that, and, you know, the threat of terror in the homeland was very real at that point in time, which continues on to this day. And then there was the talk of war. And where are we going to go? And where would it be? Well, for our near future, war was not on the horizon. I ended up getting shipped off to Okinawa, Japan, and we were with the 31st Mew for a period of about six months. Well, during that six-month period, as my battalion was stationed in Japan and then would float around in the South Pacific region, touring various countries and you know being present in that part of the world, the rest of the 5th Marine Regiment went off to the Iraq War, and they got to take part in all of that and push up and all the way through Baghdad, topple off the statue of Saddam Hussein. And those guys were just up there getting it done while we were staying on ship and training. And so we were were pretty disappointed in our luck of things. We were just watching the war unfold on TV. And we knew that when we all finally got back to beautiful San Mateo there in Southern California that everyone else from 5th Marines would be walking around bragging about their war stories and just reveling in all the glory of it all. And we were pretty frustrated. We started calling ourselves No War 2-4. It was kind of funny. These poor guys, our senior Marines, that were supposed to get out of the Marine Corps, you know, after their four years were completed, so many of them were put on hold and stop-lost, and they had to stay in extra months just to stay over in the Okinawa area. And they were so bent out of shape about it, I can't blame them. But after we returned home to California, we started another workup and another training cycle, and we got ready to deploy to Iraq. As the time to deploy came close, we found out that we were going to the city of Ramadi in the Sunni Triangle. We didn't know much about that place, We didn't know what the future really held for us, but we were told it was a peacekeeping operation 
and that most likely if we receive contact from the enemy that it would be in a four to six man group of terrorists as we were calling them at that time and that they would they would hit us and withdraw they would shoot at us and they would run and so that's the kind of stuff that we were preparing for and we were working on our patrols and ambushes and all the drills that we would do if we ever if we ever received contact from the enemy I was a fire team leader, so I had three Marines under my charge in my team. And we were just ready to go get after it and get it on. We deployed to Ramadi in February of 2004. And when we got there, we took over for an army unit that was already in place. And from our understanding, and my my understanding to this day, the soldiers had not received too much contact from the enemy. And Iraq was not the hotbed that it later became. There was a lull in the fight at this time. Saddam Hussein's power had been taken down. And there was a cancer inside of, inside of the country that was slowly metastasizing. And it was gaining its power right as we got there. When we started working in Ramadi and conducting our operations, we really went at it different than the army units that were there before us. We started going out on foot patrols and getting down into the woodwork of that city. We would be going through people's backyards and climbing over their fences and working through their houses and trying to gain as much intel as we could. And I'm not saying that the army was doing anything wrong. We were relieving a mechanized unit that was in Bradley tanks for the most part. And then we were there, and we're on foot. So it's quite a different mode of transportation we were taking. And so the nature of everything just changed. But this was now the spring, and getting into April of 2004, And things started to heat up. And one day, on April 6th, 2004, my platoon received an order to go to the government center of Ramadi and provide security because there was the threat of a a force of several hundred armed men coming to attack it. And so my platoon set out that morning in three different patrols. We all took different directions in our various squads, and headed off to the government center. While we were on our way, one of our squads came under attack. And so my squad just started off in their direction to go reinforce them. And we could hear the sounds of the machine guns in the distance, and explosions, and the sound of excitement, and action. And as we got closer... All of a sudden, everything was deserted in front of us. It was like walking through a ghost town, and the feeling was extremely eerie. And I remember my point man, Derek Halal, a young 24-year-old Marine from Indianapolis, Indiana. He kept looking back at me and wondering, do I keep pushing forward into this? And I was unsure myself. I kept turning around and looking at my platoon sergeant and saying, you want us to keep going? It just felt wrong. It felt so strange. But we knew we had to get to our buddies. And so we just kept pushing through. And we were almost at a jog pace when all of a sudden gunfire opened up on us from every direction. It was loud. It was intense. It was rapid. It was just 360 gunfire at us. And we're out there basically in the middle of a street. There's parked cars in the area. There's there's houses. There's brick walls. There's just nothing to hide behind. And all we could do was just take a knee right there in the street and start returning fire at whatever we thought the threat was coming from. And, you know, that that was when I realized that it's not like the movies. And... You can't just see the bad guys just popping out on the corner of the street shooting at you. They're smarter than that. They are inside of a building 
they're shooting through an open window possibly and they're far back in the room so you're, you're never going to see the flash of their muzzle the sounds are echoing all around you it's extremely hard to pinpoint any threat and you know it was it was just extremely confusing it was like where are these guys so the gunfire stops miraculously and we look around and we check on each other and no one's hit thank god and our squad leader and platoon sergeant decided to break off half the squad and start going into some houses and checking for these bad guys and so what ends up happening is me, Derek Halal, my point man, and another Marine, we're left on this street corner intersection, just watching their six, making sure no one sneaks up on them as they go into, into some houses. And while we're out there, there's nothing going on. And we can hear them start shooting and throwing hand grenades, and we can hear yelling, and it sounded like a darn good time. And we wanted a piece of it. So while we're out there on this corner, I look and a few hundred yards away from me, there's a man holding an AK-47. And I'm looking at him. And I'm like, that's a threat. So this guy ducks into a building and we make our way down there. And what I've now done is I've divided our forces my squad leader knows about it. My platoon sergeant knows about it. But again, all of our intel tells us that these guys are going to shoot and run. And that's what we were really prepared for that day. And as we're down there, we get to this next intersection, the three of us. And all of a sudden, we're under heavy fire. And we've got guys in elevated positions on various sides of the street, shooting down on us from parapet roofs where they can hide behind a block wall or they can hide behind a concrete wall. And there's really nothing that our 5.56 five, is going to do to that. You know, our weapons are really inadequate for that. And we're continually engaging these targets and these guys are popping up and then dropping down. And it was very coordinated what they were doing. And then all of a sudden we've got guys shooting at us from farther down the street, from different directions down different streets. And the three of us are just really caught in the open and, ex and exposed. As this is going on, suddenly, my buddy Derek is hit in the leg. He goes down in the street. I ended up dragging him back to the side of the street corner. And we're still exposed with no cover, no concealment. We've got multiple positions shooting at us. And my squad leader ends up sending down two more Marines and a corpsman. They get down there. And just because we have a few more guns, it, it really didn't alleviate the situation. We're still getting shot at by a lot of people. And so my buddy Derek, he, uh, he's in a lot of pain. He's bleeding. I wasn't aware of the extent of the injury, but I knew he couldn't walk. It turned out that his femur was shattered. And he's telling me, Corporal Hayes, don't let me die out here. I've never forgot him saying that to me. Don't let me die out here. While all of this is going on, we notice that these bad guys out there are reinforcing themselves with more men. And a block or two down... They're driving in with more cars and hopping out of their cars and shooting at us. So with this situation of the enemy being able to hide behind vehicles and shoot at us, and my Marine, Derek, wounded, I made the decision to have him move back with the support of two other Marines down towards this T intersection where we would have some more cover and some more distance from the enemy. So as they're Helping him walk back there, I decided to use an AT-4, which is an anti-tank rocket. And I was hoping to blow up one of these cars with it. It was going to be a long shot, two or three hundred meters. 
but I was going to go for it. We really didn't have another option. And so I'm out there in the street, completely exposed. And as I'm getting this thing ready to go, one of the enemy from an elevated position pops up from behind a ledge and lets out a spray and hits Derek in the head. The bullet goes through his helmet, into his head, and he goes down. That stopped everything. When that happened, we all just dropped down to the deck and just started opening fire on everything. I had just let down my Marine and his one request when he told me, Corporal Hayes, don't let me die out here. I just let him down. And so there we are in the prone position, just returning fire at whatever we could. It was almost too much for me. And we're cut off from the rest of our squad. And now we've got a dead Marine and and we can't go anywhere. To pick him up and remove him from this situation under all of this gunfire, it seemed like a losing proposition. And so we just kept shooting. I'm getting thoughts going through my head about my family. I'm wondering, am I going to see them again? This isn't going away. These guys aren't just hitting us and then taking off. These guys are hitting us and reinforcing themselves. Something else is going on. They're elevated positions. They're hiding behind cars. They're pouring in by the car load. They've got part of our squad pinned down in houses. We're pinned down here. We've got another squad 500 or 1,000 meters away. They're pinned down. This isn't going our way. It's not going according to plan. And while we're dealing with all this, suddenly there's an explosion up at the street corner. An explosion happens, and these power lines or telephone lines, whatever they were, they start whipping around and sparking And I'm laying right next to my buddy, Corporal Ortiz. And we just look at each other and we say, Oh no, they've got grenades. And the next thing we know, we've got a hand grenade bouncing down our way. And I remember it so vividly. I can remember the shape of this thing and the color of it. And this thing is coming right our way. We're in the prone And there's nothing we can do about it. There's no running away. And it stops rolling, I would say, anywhere from 12 to 15 feet away from us. And the way our bodies were positioned, I knew that my buddy Ortiz was going to get it worse than I was. And so in a last-ditch effort to just help up my buddy, I threw my arm over his face and covered him up the best I could. And then this thing blew up. And it rocked us. I've never been hit so hard in all my life. Nor since then. And the best way I could describe it, which may not even make sense, is I felt like my body was hit by an earthquake. Like a 9.0 on the Richter scale went right through my chest. After it blew up, I remember looking down on the ground and I see my left hand is covered in blood. And I I pushed myself up off the deck and I picked up my weapon and I just stood up in plain view, completely open and exposed to the enemy. And the reason I did that was because I was so dazed. I was hit hard by this thing. And I just started walking back towards this T intersection. I completely disregarded my buddy, Ortiz. I was so out of it. I mean, this thing, 
it, it'd be like getting hit in the face with a two by four. It just knocked me. And I get down to this intersection and the other Marines had pulled down there as well. And we've got Derek still laying there in the street. So we're now removed from him by, by maybe 30 meters or so. And I've got shrapnel that it's gone through the magazine of my weapon. And my left hand is, is just swelling up like a softball. It's huge. It had, it had broken bones and there's no more using my left hand. And, uh, I had one of my Marines fix my weapon and remove a magazine, put another one back in and rack it for me. And then we just lay down in the prone position at this T intersection. So imagine a T. So we only had three directions to cover. And this was better for us. So straight in front of you and then left and right. And we're laying there. Thank God my dad, my dad was such a gun nut. He had bought me some bipods to put on my weapon in Iraq. And now I don't have a left hand that's operable. So I'm just laying there in the prone and I got my bipods from my dad. Thank God. And we're shooting and the enemy is still there and they're shooting back and we got rounds snapping over our heads. And the, the terror of what was going on was so real because we were getting extremely desperate. And I remember just the feeling of everything. My hand is all messed up. My buddy Ortiz, he's hitting his left hand as well. And it was much worse than mine. His looks like a pound of hamburger. It was just shredded by this grenade. And he's losing a lot of blood. But what a tough man. I mean, no complaining, no whining about it, just just dealing with it and continuing on in the fight. But it was getting desperate. And so I told my men, I said, every one of you better start praying right now. Pray to God that he gets us out of here. And there we were, laying in the street, slinging lead and saying prayers to God. I was literally yelling at the top of my lungs, like just saying, God, deliver us. Help us to shoot straight. Help us kill the enemy. Be our strength. Help us to get out of here. Deliver us, O oh Lord. There is no time in my life that I've been more desperate than this time. It felt like the enemy was invincible. I've said that it's just not like the movies. You know, I'm, I'm sure we were hitting these guys, but they weren't doing backflips like they do in all the cool Hollywood flicks. That's not what was happening. You hit him with that little tiny 5.56, five, and, you know, I guess if you get a headshot, they're going to go down quick, but that's hard to get at multiple hundreds of meters, and everything just happens so fast, and they're really hard to see. You know, you talk to these guys from Vietnam, and you'll, you'll have guys that have spent an entire tour of 13 months over in Vietnam slinging lead with the enemy, and some of them will tell you that they never even saw the enemy. And a lot of that was what was going on that day. Now, we did see the enemy. You could see them pouring in by the car load, but, but they were hard to hit. And they wouldn't stay there exposed. You know, they would stick the barrel of their AK-47 around a corner from 300 meters away and be shooting at you. How are you going to see that rifle? There's no way. It's in the middle of the day. You don't see a muzzle flash. All you hear is that snapping sound over your head and that cracking. And so we were crying out to the Lord, feeling desperate, feeling low. There was nothing good happening that day. We needed out of there. We needed support. And where was it? Well, I serve a God who saves. And he heard my prayer, and he answered me. And soon after, Cobra helicopters started flying overhead. 
And they started zapping those bad dudes down there. And that picked up our spirits and gave us some encouragement. You know, seeing these two helicopters flying overhead and we're looking at them and you can see their turret on the bottom of it moving around and changing directions and then letting forth with a burst and zapping some guys down there hiding behind a car. Oh man, what a sight to behold. And then farther off in the distance, we could hear the sound of heavy guns behind us. Way off in the distance. And we knew, that's a fifty cal. That's a Mark 19. That's a thirty caliber machine gun. And we knew the Marines were on their way. And we started feeling encouraged. And we're looking down these two alleyways to our left and right. And then to the left we started seeing Marines running by and they had no notice of us at this point in time, but we started yelling out to them, Marines, Marines over here. You know, we had no other way to link up. I couldn't throw, I couldn't throw smoke. I couldn't pop a flare. I couldn't call them on the radio. There was just nothing except the sound of our voice. And now we're worried about some fratricide. And if with us shooting where we're at, we don't want our Marine buddies to think that we're the enemy. And open fire on us. So it's real dicey. But eventually. A team of Marines come down to me. Led by. David Walter. With Todd Bolding. Two good friends of mine. And. They get up there. And once we had that team of Marines with us. From the first platoon. Of golf company. It seemed that the tide had turned. And that we were going to be okay. And so they're hanging out there with us. And then next, Captain Bronzy comes up to me. And I had nothing but love and respect for that man since the moment that I met him. And he comes up to me, and I'll never forget what he said. He said, what do you got, Corporal Hayes? And I said, I got a dead Marine, sir. And he said, all right, let's go get him. And... We had a Humvee come up and position itself down this street where we were situated at and start opening up with machine gun fire to suppress the enemy. And then Captain Bronzy and I ran down and we grabbed on to Derek Halal and we brought him back to us. And then I knelt down and said a prayer over him as I said goodbye. They ended up getting me and several other Marines who were wounded and eventually got a shuttle off to the hospital in Ramadi. And the city was going completely crazy that day. We lost Derek. I lost another young man in my squad named Moises Langhorst, who was with the, the other half of our squad in those houses. And he was shot by the enemy and killed. A good, solid, young, 18-year-old Marine from Moose Lake, Minnesota. Now, I want to tell you the hope about Derek. I was crushed by his death. But there is hope. Because several days before this, Derek and I were lying next to each other in an ambush. And we're talking back and forth at about two in the morning and we're just asking each other questions, you know, just, we're just being buddies. And I started asking him about his faith and Derek told me that as a young man, he had accepted Christ into his life and that he knew he was a sinner, but he chose to place his faith in Jesus to forgive him for his sins. And he told me that he based his salvation off of Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, which says, For by grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, so that no man can boast. I later talked to Derek's family about this. I talked to his mom and his dad. I told him about our conversation I told him about how their son went out 
how he went out like a warrior. He never gave up. Sure, he didn't want to die there. None of us did. But that's the way the battle happened. But Derek had committed something to Christ long before that battle, and it mattered on that day. And when I watched him fall in the fight, as horrible as it was, there was still hope. Because I knew at that moment that the Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And I knew where Derek was. He was with Jesus. Now, you know something about me. You know what I've been through. That's part of it. And with that event, my life has been changed. Since that day in 2004, I have lived with the guilt and regret of letting down my buddy. Because it was my decisions in play that day. I was the one giving the orders. And when he told me, Corporal Hayes, don't let me die out here. Obviously, I let down my end of the deal. And there's many things that have come to me through all of this. There is stress and anxiety. And there is despair. And there are physiological changes within my body that have manifested themselves due to the experiences and the stress of all of it. And I can't change those things. But I can give them up. You know, it is not up to me how the flow of the battle goes. It's up to God. And God knows our days from the end all the way back to the beginning. And he had Derek's days planned out from the foundation of the world. And he had that battle planned out all the way from the beginning. It wasn't up to little Joe Hayes. It wasn't up to Corporal Hayes. Corporal Hayes tried as hard as he could, and it wasn't good enough. We all tried as hard as we could. And the only reason we got out was not because we all tried hard. It was because the Lord delivered us. And with all of that, I just have to say that my respect and admiration for all of my Marines that fought with me that day, they did so well. Derek fought so well and so hard. Derek was awarded the Bronze Star posthumously and the Purple Heart. And he fought like a valiant man that day. And I'll never forget it. And I'll never stop bragging about what he did. And he selflessly laid down his life for this country. And for his Marines. And he loved us and we loved him right back. And we were determined not to leave him there on that battlefield. No matter what it took. We could have easily ran up and and took off from there. But we stayed there because of him. Because we were committed Because he was our buddy, our brother. And that's who we were. And he would have done the same for all of us. And I can't say enough amazing things about the men of 1st Platoon and Golf Company. And the men of Weapons Company that came out there with those heavy guns blazing. Just stacking bodies. And laying waste to our enemies. They fought so valiantly. My buddy David, my buddy Todd, who was killed three weeks later, a good Christian young man, I'll never forget him. And I'll have you know that this battle raged on for three days, and we had 12 Marines killed in our battalion. And the 2nd Battalion, 4th Marines, the Magnificent Bastards, destroyed several hundred insurgents. And they had us outnumbered that day on April 6th. 
But by April 10th, the Marines from the Magnificent Bastards were driving around in Humvees, blasting Arabic language on loudspeakers and begging them to come back out and fight us. And they would not. Because we utterly destroyed them. But I got to say that after all these years, PTSD is a real thing. And it hurts. And this isn't the only thing that I've had to go through. And it's not the only thing that my Marines have gone through since then. Because life continues to happen. And bad things continue to happen to good people. And it just keeps on going. And it just keeps on spiraling out of control. And you're in the battle. And you're being suppressed by the enemy. And you're being shot at. And everything's going wrong. You know, this day on April 6th feels like a lot of days in my life where I'm not being physically shot at, but I'm being spiritually shot at or emotionally emotionally shot at. And it's hard. Life comes at you fast, doesn't it? And so what is the answer? Well, I'm going to do what David did. King David was a man of war. And he was a man of God. And he chose to cry out to God. And I have taken Psalm 116 as my life psalm. I really adopted this psalm several years ago. Because I feel like it talks about me. And my relationship with God. Let me get into it a little bit for you. It says, I love the Lord because he has heard my voice And my supplications. Because he has inclined his ear to me. Therefore I will call upon him. As long as I live. The pains of death surrounded me. And the pangs of Sheol. Laid hold of me. I found trouble and sorrow. Then I called upon the name of the Lord. O Lord I implore you. Deliver my soul. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Yes, our God is merciful. The Lord preserves the simple. I was brought low and he saved me. Return to your rest, O my soul, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. For you have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, and my feet from falling. I will walk before the Lord In the land of the living. The psalm goes on, and I encourage you to read it. It is one that I have read over and over and over again. Because it speaks to our position with God and where he's at with this as well. It says, That David loves the Lord because God has heard his voice and the things that he is asking. Because God has inclined his ear to him. That God has reached down with his ear to listen to David. Because he cares about what David is going through and what David has to say to him. God wants that note, that closeness with David. Where he can give him that access to himself. And he gives that to me. And God gives that to you. Where when you call upon the Lord and you say, Lord, deliver me. Because I'm going through something that I cannot control right now. The battle is raging all around me. It's horrible. I hate it. I can't get out of it. I can't do anything. Deliver me. When you cry out to God like that, God reaches down and inclines his ear to you. He will turn his ear in your direction and listen to you. And David says, because you do that, Lord, I will call upon you as long as I live. I'm not just going to stop calling upon you in the day of battle. I'm going to call upon you every day of my life. David says he found trouble and sorrow. I know what that's like. I found trouble and I found sorrow. 
Then I called upon the name of the Lord to deliver my soul. I beg of you, God, deliver my soul. Have you asked God to deliver your soul? You know, we have troubling and sorrowing situations that we have to deal with from time to time. But there's another sorrow and another troubling situation, and that is the situation of our soul. Has the Lord delivered your soul? You need to ask yourself that. You need to examine that. Because like my buddy Derek did, you need to do. Derek had put his faith and his trust in Jesus Christ for his salvation. Derek knew that he was a sinner, that he had violated God's law and God's commandments, and that he was unrighteous before his sight. And Derek did this. He said, God, I am unrighteous. I am unworthy but you are. I call upon you. I put my faith in you, Jesus, in your righteousness, in your blood, in your sacrifice. I offer you nothing because I am worthless. Please forgive me of my sins. Please come into my life. Make me new. When the Father sees me, Let him see your blood, Jesus, and your righteousness. That is what Derek Halal had done. That was the decision he had made in the petition he had asked of God. And that's what David had done. David is obviously before the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, but we know that the cross reaches all the way back to the beginning. And the cross covered David. And David asked God, deliver my soul. And he says this of God, that God is gracious and righteous. Gracious meaning he gives you unmerited favor. You don't deserve the favor that God gives you. He gives it to you in spite of the fact that you don't deserve it. And he's righteous. Think about how cruel and wicked the world is. There's despair everywhere. And God is righteous. And it says he's merciful. He gives forgiveness. He applies mercy. He looks down on you and he forgives you when you ask of him. It says the Lord preserves the simple you got to recognize that you're simple. Don't be puffed up. Don't be prideful. Don't think that you can handle all of it. Hey, I knew on April 6th, I can't handle this. I'm done. I'm going to die here. I'm running out of ammo. I'm blown up. I'm dehydrated. I'm about to vomit. I've got my buddy that's dead, my other team leader that's wounded. We're cut off from all support. We're in a desperate situation. I'm simple. I'm brought low. And that's when I cried out to the Lord. And he saved me. And so David says this. He gives a command to his soul. He says, return to your rest, O my soul. He's saying rest. Stop worrying about it. Stop stressing. Release the anxiety. Just rest. Because the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. That means because the Lord has given you much, much more than you deserve. He's given you more than you need. And what is it that he's done? He's done this. He says, for you have delivered my soul from death. So you have taken care of me in the eternity. You have preserved my soul so that I will see eternity with Jesus and spend time with him, eternity in heaven. 
you have delivered my eyes from tears and my feet from falling. So, you know, we serve a God who is going to wipe away every tear from your eyes. That doesn't mean you're not going to cry. You're going to cry. You're a human being. When you experience sorrow, it makes you cry. It doesn't make you tough to be able to hold it back. You just cry. And as I have gone on further into life, I've realized that I cry a lot more now than I ever used to. Because I know sorrow and I know pain. But God doesn't promise you that you're not going to cry, but he does say that he'll wipe the tears out of your eyes. Because we serve a God who comforts us and who loves us. And he cares about what's going on inside of us. And he delivers our feet from falling. So he takes care of our soul. He takes care of our emotions. And he gives us solid support under our feet. And so David says this. He makes a statement. And I have made this statement. I want you to make this statement in your own life. If you want to make a promise to a friend like this, go ahead. If you want to write it down somewhere, go ahead. But David says, he says, because of all this, because you have delivered me, I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. David's not going to give up. He's going to walk before the Lord. He's going to serve God. He's going to commit his life to God. He's going to stay right where God wants him. As long as David is in the land of the living and breathing oxygen, he's going to walk before the Lord. That's all he knows he's going to do. You think about what David's done, what he's been through. This man, at the age of maybe 14 to 16 years old, slung a rock at the forehead of Goliath and watched it bash in his skull. And then he ran up and decapitated the guy. David is a warrior. David has killed hundreds and hundreds of Philistines with the sword. Close contact battle. Bloody, gruesome battle. Like, if you've ever watched Braveheart, that type of battle would be what David was familiar with. You think David didn't have PTSD? You think David didn't have buddies that he loved that died on the battlefield? And he, he didn't see his close friend with his face split open in half from a sword or a spear or a rock or an axe? David saw it all. He had loss. He had grief. He had guilt. He had times where he did it great, and then he had times where he screwed it all up. But his answer here, with all of the stress, with all of the anxiety, with the guilt, with the responsibility of things that have gone wrong when he thought they could go right, his response is this. All those things may be going on, but I'm going to walk before the Lord in the land of the living. What God has taught me through all of this is that the battle is not over. We live in a torn up world, but we have a king who has a plan, and that plan is to redeem you from the evil that is around you. He wants to renew your mind and be your God. The day of battle is ongoing. It is not time to drop your weapon and take off your boots. You need to get ready. Get trained up in the word of God. Remember as you push forward into the battle, lock and load. The Lord will go before you and the God of Israel will be your rear guard. He has your 12 and he has your six. 